Welcome to this lecture about the T distribution. We'll first review the basics of confidence intervals and make sure that we understand why we cannot use the value 1.96 to create 95% confidence intervals when the sample size is small. We'll then see how we can create confidence intervals by using an appropriate value from the T distribution. Finally, we'll have a look at some notations for confidence intervals. In a previous lecture, we saw how the standard error of the mean was calculated when we knew the value of sigma, the population standard deviation. To estimate the mean height of the population, we took a sample of four individuals and computed the mean. The mean height of these four individuals is 166 centimeters. Since we knew the standard deviation and the sample size, we could calculate the standard error of the mean to 5. We then calculated the 95% confidence interval by taking the estimated mean plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error. The lower and upper bound of the 95% confidence interval was computed to 156.2 and 175.8. Then we took a new random sample from the population. The mean height of these four individuals was 164. Note that the standard error is still 5 because our sample size is still 4 and we used the known standard deviation of 10. The following 95% confidence interval was calculated based on this second sample. These two intervals can be represented graphically like this. If we add a reference line that represents the true population mean 170, we see that both intervals include the population mean. If we would repeat the sampling 20 times, we would get 20 different confidence intervals like this. Since the 95% confidence interval tells us that we are 95% certain that it includes the true population mean, 1 out of 20 intervals is expected to not include the true population mean. What is important to understand is that all these confidence intervals will have exactly the same length because the standard error is based on a known standard deviation of 10 and that all intervals are based on the same sample size. For example, these two intervals have exactly the same length. The only difference is their location because their associated sample means are different. However, in real studies, we usually have no idea about the value of the population standard deviation. We therefore need to estimate the standard deviation based on our sample data. In conclusion, if we know the population standard deviation, we can use this simple formula to calculate the 95% confidence interval. If we do not know the population standard deviation, but where the sample size is large, for example greater than 100, we can estimate the standard deviation based on the sample and basically use the same formula for calculating the confidence interval. However, if we need to estimate the standard deviation based on a small sample, we can no longer use 1.96 as a factor for creating our 95% confidence interval. We then have to use a larger value taken from the so-called t-distribution. The reason why we need a larger value will now be explained with the same example data as we have used earlier. This is the same data as we have seen previously. However, we now pretend that we do not know the population standard deviation, which commonly reflects a real situation. This means that we need to estimate it along with the mean. We estimate the mean to 166 and the standard deviation to 8.2. Remember that in the previous example, we used the known standard deviation of 10, whereas the standard deviation is here estimated to 8.2. The standard error is now calculated to 4.1, and if we now multiply the standard error by 1.96 to generate the 95% confidence interval, then we see that the interval goes from approximately 158 to 174. However, the fact of 1.96 is not appropriate to use, which we will see in the next few slides. We now draw a new sample of four individuals. This time, due to chance, the individuals happen to have very similar body heights, 
The estimated mean is 166 and estimates the standard deviation is now only about 1.15. The standard error is therefore now only 0 0.58. Since our sample of four individuals happen to have about the same body height, the 95% confidence interval will be very narrow. If we add the two 95% confidence intervals that we have just calculated, they might graphically look something like this. If we take 18 additional samples, we might get the following confidence intervals. Since we have estimated the standard deviation of these confidence intervals, they will vary in length. For example, this confidence interval is very narrow, whereas this confidence interval is very wide. In contrast, when we calculate the 95% confidence intervals based on the known population standard deviation, the width of the confidence intervals will be exactly the same because the standard deviation is identical for all calculations. The only thing that varies between these confidence intervals is their location due to different estimates of the mean. In comparison, when we estimate the standard deviation from the sample, some confidence intervals will be, due to chance, very narrow. Due to this effect, more than 5% of the intervals will not include the true population mean. With a sample size of 4, about 14% of the intervals will not include the population mean. In this example, 3 out of the 20 intervals did not include the true population mean. Our intervals will therefore not represent 95% confidence intervals because less than 95 out of 100 intervals will include the true population mean. However, if you multiply the standard error by a factor of about 3.18 instead of 1.96, then we will adjust the confidence intervals so they get a bit wider. Multiplying by 3.18 instead of 1.96, the confidence intervals become about 60% longer. We now expect that these new and longer intervals cover the true population mean 95 out of 100 times. The factor of 3.18 has therefore adjusted the intervals so that they now represent 95% confidence intervals even for small samples when the standard deviation is estimated. For example, we see that only one out of the 20 intervals does not include the true population mean. So, where does the value 3.18 come from? The value 3.18 comes from a t distribution with three degrees of freedom. We will discuss the meaning of degrees of freedom in another video. In this example, the degrees of freedom is the sample size minus 1. In my previous video about the normal distribution, we saw that the area between negative 1.96 and positive 1.96 covered 95% of the standard normal distribution, which is the reason why we use 1.96 as a factor in our 95% confidence intervals when the standard deviation is known. This is how a t-distribution with 3 degrees of freedom looks like. Just as the normal distribution, the t-distribution is also bell-shaped and symmetric. For a t distribution with 3 degrees of freedom, the interval between negative 3.18 and positive 3.18 covers about 95% of the area. This is why we used 3.18 as the factor in our previous 95% confidence interval to adjust that we estimate the standard deviation and use the sample size of 4. If we plot the t distribution on top of the standard normal distribution, we see that the t distribution has a lower peak and is wider compared to the normal distribution. This is why the values for the interval that covers 95% of the distribution are further away from the mean compared to the standard normal distribution. However, if we take a larger sample, for example 10 individuals, it is less likely that we happen to pick individuals of about the same body height. Our estimated standard deviation would then be closer to the true population standard deviation 
and our sample size was only 4, the size of the confidence intervals varied a lot, which was the reason why we had to multiply the standard error by 3.18 instead of 1.96. In comparison, when we increased the sample size to 10, the size of the intervals will vary less and we can multiply the standard error by 2.26 instead of 3.18. The value of 2.26 comes from a t-distribution with 9 degrees of freedom, since our sample size is 10. Remember that the degrees of freedom in this case is the sample size minus 1. The t-distribution will approach the shape of the standard normal distribution when the degrees of freedom increases. For example, We'll now see what happens with the t-distribution when you increase the degrees of freedom from 3 to 5, 9, 15, 50, and 100. We can see that if the degrees of freedom is 100, the t-distribution is almost identical to the normal distribution. The more we increase the sample size, and thus the degrees of freedom, the closer we will get to the normal distribution. Here are some examples of values that define the range which cover 95% of the t-distribution. We have previously seen that for a t-distribution with 3 degrees of freedom, the values negative 3.18 and positive 3.18 define the range that covers 95% of the distribution. Whereas for a t-distribution with 9 degrees of freedom, the values negative 2.26 and positive 2.26 define the range that covers 95% of the distribution. For a t-distribution with 100 degrees of freedom, the corresponding values are about negative 1.98 and positive 1.98. Note that the value 1.98 is very close to 1.96 from the standard normal distribution. This is the reason why it is ok to use 1.96 to simplify the calculations for the 95% confidence interval when the sample size is bigger than 100 and the population standard deviation is unknown. So, where do we find the values for the range that covers 95% of the t-distribution? The old way is to use the so-called t-table whereas most people today extract these values by using a statistical software. Note that most statistical software tools will automatically find appropriate values based on our sample size. We therefore usually never need to extract these values when we use the software to compute confidence intervals. Finally, we'll have a look at some notations that are commonly used for confidence intervals. The difference from our previous formula for the confidence interval is that we now have this notation instead of the value 1.96. This notation tells us that we should use a z-score or c-score from the standard normal distribution for a certain value of alpha. If we like to use a 95% confidence interval, we can calculate alpha by subtracting 0.95 from 1 which gives us an alpha value of 0.05. This value corresponds to the total area in the tails, where each tail covers 2.5% of the area. If we divide alpha by 2, we get the area of just one of the tails. This notation therefore tells us that we should use the z-score that defines a certain area of the right tail, if we use a 95% confidence interval, alpha divided by 2 will be equal to 0 0.025, which is the area to the right hand side of 1.96. In contrast, if we like to use a 99% confidence interval, the value of alpha will be equal to 0 0.01, and we therefore like to know the z-score which defines 0.5% of the upper tail. For a standard normal distribution, that value is 2.576. If we like to create a 99% confidence interval, we should therefore use the value 2.576 instead of 1.96. If our sample size is small and we need to estimate the standard deviation, we should use this formula for the confidence interval. 
This notation tells us that we should use a t-score from a t-distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom for a given value of alpha. For example, if we like a 95% confidence interval and use a sample size of 4, we should extract the t-score from a t-distribution with 3 degrees of freedom that defines 2.5% of the area for the upper tail. In this case, we would use a t-score of 3.18 to create a 95% confidence interval. This was the end of this lecture about confidence intervals and the t-distribution. In the next video, we have a look at the one-sample t-test.